sing that Lord prepare me Pastor Jay worship with us this morning as we sing Lord prepare me so thankful, God, for your sweet Holy Spirit abiding in this place today. Lord, my prayer today is that it would be you and you alone that's seen and glorified in this place. Let your word go forth today with power, with authority, with healing, God. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, anything that would hinder or distract, Lord, may it find no rest in this house today. Lord, as I come today, Lord, I confess the reality is I'm nothing. I testify publicly, Lord, I acknowledge it before men today, God, that you and you alone are my strength, the very breath that I breathe. Lord, I'm nothing but a tool in your hand. Use me however you see fit, Lord, for your glory. Let it be indeed your word that goes forth today and not the word of a man. And I pray that it's you and you alone that's seen and glorified in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter. I want to continue the theme this morning on serving. And the title of my message this morning is simply a call to serve. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 says, As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Or as another translation puts it, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Look at your neighbor and tell them, use what God gave you. God's given every one of us gifts, talents, abilities. You've got to understand that those don't always come wrapped up in some sort of super spiritual packaging. God may have blessed you just to hold a baby in the nursery. That's a gift. Trust me, there's some folks you don't want them working with kids. Amen. Some raising a hand. The reality is, even the little things that you may not see as gifts, God's given you that gift. Whether it's the education to know how to do certain trades or skills, God's given you that gift or the opportunity to get that knowledge. Amen. Last week we talked about 
not burying that talent. So I want you to understand first and foremost this morning that God's word tells us that we're to use whatever gift that he's given. And the Bible makes it clear all good things, all these gifts come from God. You're not smart enough to have gotten that knowledge on your own. God blessed you. Flip with me, if you will, this morning to Mark chapter 10. And keep your Bibles handy and open this morning. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is a story of the rich young ruler. But it says, and when he was gone, uh, when he was gone forth into the way, as being Jesus, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to go to heaven? The reality is most of us here this morning, probably all of us, truth be told, want to go to heaven. I believe most people come to church because that's what they want. They want to go to heaven. But there's a cost to pay. Salvation is free. I understand that. Don't don't put words in my mouth and don't let me confuse you. It's the grace of God lest any man should boast. but, But I want you to understand there's a cost for following Jesus. We flip on down in this same chapter, verse 21. Jesus, beholding this young man, said to him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Jesus confronted him. There's a cost. You, you want to go to heaven? There's a cost. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody wants to pay the price to be a disciple of Christ. He comes to him, and what a great question. It's a, it's a wonderful question. This rich young ruler approaches Jesus. I love it. He, he knows where to go. He's in the right place talking to the right person, Jesus, Lord, great teacher, master. What do I have to do to go to heaven? Just like many today, they're in the church. They know where they need to go. They know what they need to do. He says to him, well, keep their commands. In other words, he he talks about being good because he knows that's what's already in his heart. You know, I'm a good person. I I do a lot of good things. I'm a religious person. And, And so Jesus goes ahead and gets that out of the way. And then he says, but one thing you lack. Sell all that you've got. Take up your cross and follow me. What he was saying is, sell out to me. Do do you really want to go where I'm going? Are you willing to sell out? Are you willing to sell out to the world to follow me? Because there may come times in life where you'll have to choose at that crossroad. Will I follow God or will I follow my plans? Will I follow God or will I follow what I want to do? Will I follow God or will I follow what my lover wants me to do? There may come times in life where you've got to choose at that crossroad which way you'll go. One of the most tragic passages in all the scripture is right here what I'm reading for you. It says this young man went away grieved and sad. Went away. Now he's just been given an invitation. You want to go where I'm going then that's great. Take up your cross and follow me. He invited him to follow him. He invited him basically handed him a ticket to heaven. You want to go then go. Come on. He went away not because he didn't want to go. He went away because Jesus offended him. And pay attention this morning. He didn't walk away sad because he didn't want to go to heaven. That's exactly why he came to Jesus. I want to go to heaven. What do I have to do? The issue, I, I know that some may say... Well, because he asked him to sell everything. No, that's a byproduct of what he really asked him to do. The thing that offended him, he says, take up your cross and follow me. See, the cross is a symbol of death. If you take up your cross, then the money won't matter. The stuff you've got won't matter. He said, the one thing you like, the one thing we need to deal with is you're not ready to pay the price to follow me. There's a cost Listen, he says, take up your cross and follow me. 
And he went away grieved. I wonder how many walk away from God week in and week out because what he's asked of you is more than you want to pay. What he's asked of you is more than you want to offer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and pastor who was executed by the Nazis in 1945 for opposing their ideology and military campaign, he said, salvation without discipleship is cheap grace. Jesus never taught cheap grace. Discipleship is following him, selling out. What we want today, we have an appetite for for cheap grace. What we have an appetite for is is microwave salvation. Let me come to church, get a a, a microwave sermon, feel good about myself, and and me and God are going to be all right. But that's cheap grace. The invitation was clear. It was given. You want to go where I'm going? That's wonderful. Here's the ticket. He holds it in his hand basically. Then then take up your cross and follow me. The ticket is the cross. The cross is offensive. The cross is bloody. The cross is a symbol of death. Where your desires are laid down for the cause of Christ. The cross is offensive. People don't want people, the pastors to preach the blood anymore because the blood's offensive. If it weren't for the blood, you and I wouldn't be saved. You were redeemed. You were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross is offensive. The cross, listen, when they would bear that cross upon their shoulders, the weight of it would drag a line in the sand. This is exactly what it means to carry your cross. It draws a line in the sand. And it declares whatever I once was, I am no longer. I stand for God and anything on the other side of that I'm against. It forces a man or woman to choose where they are in relation to Christ. And at this, he walked away sad, offended. I say it like this, Jesus is looking for followers, not fans. I've said it many times, I'm a simple-minded guy. The church is full of fans. Even in Jesus' day, he had many fans but few followers. At one point, he's preaching to the multitude and he began to talk to them and, and he said something about them drinking the blood. Many of them left. He looks at his disciples and he says, will you two leave? The ones that left were the fans. I want to be there when the miracles happen. I want to be there when the tickets to heaven are handed out. I want to be there when I need God for something. But when it's time just to follow him self-sacrificing. There's no such thing as cheap grace. He's looking for followers, not fans. See, in order to be a follower, it requires you to take your cross. Hear me this morning. I talked to you last week about God's plan for your life. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it, it makes it very clear. And that's just one scripture. I could give you many more, but that's just such a, a very simple, poignant scripture. These are the plans that I have for you. God has a plan for your life. But that plan is twofold. First, it is a plan of salvation, a call to salvation. Amen? God's first plan for your life is to call you unto him, unto salvation. The second part of God's plan is a call to serve. The title of this message again this morning is the call to serve. God's called you to be saved and he's called you and saved you that you might serve. Take up your cross and follow him. Salvation is not a momentary experience at an altar. You may come down to the altar and and, and you may be saved in a moment, but salvation is a, a lifestyle. The moment that I was truly saved, my life changed, flipped right side up. It's a lifestyle. I, I'm, I'm no longer the person I used to be when I took that cross up 
Many times I came to an altar and I wept bitter tears. Many times I came with the fear of hell gripping my heart because I didn't want to go to hell. I knew I wasn't going to heaven. I knew that I weren't ready if Christ had came for me that day. And I'd come to the altar out of fear of going to hell, but I was not ready to take up a cross. I wanted the cheap grace. Oh, God, forgive me, Lord. If you come today, God, I, I want to be ready, but I wasn't willing to take up my cross. I'm preaching to somebody this morning. He's looking for followers, not fans. I was a fan of Jesus. I wanted whatever he had to offer, but I did not want to pay the price to be his disciple. Ted Ingstrom tells about cleaning out a desk drawer and he found an old flashlight. It wouldn't work, so he beat on it a little bit and then Decided to take it apart. He noticed when he opened it up that the batteries were badly corroded. And then he realized the reason. He had put the flashlight in a warm and comfortable spot. But it was not designed or intended to be warm and comfortable. It was intended to give light. He says, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and he said, it's the same with us. You and I were not created to be warm, safe, and comfortable. You and I were made to be turned on, to put our lives to work, to apply our patience in difficult, trying situations, to let our light shine. God calls each of us to let our light so shine in the world. We do that through simple acts of kindness. And I say that this morning. I want to ask you. God has given you gifts. That flashlight was created for a purpose. Not just to be tucked away someplace. God has given each of you gifts. You may be a five talent person. You may be a two talent. One, every one of us have been given gifts by God. So I want to ask you. Are you using those gifts for God's glory? Are they tucked away because you're quite comfortable? See many come to church week in and week out. We're comfortable. But God called you to more than that. The gifts belong to him. Every one of those gifts are to be used for the glory of God. Last week we uncovered this, this, this parable of the talents where this man had been given one talent. And he buried it in the earth. And, and when his master came, he said, you wicked and lazy servant. God's words, not mine. You, you, you may look at this and think it's not much, but I told you again last week, the, the talent was a, a weight. It was how much something weighed. So if he had been given a talent of silver or whatever, it would have been, it would have been more than years' worth of salary. Depending on what that talent was, whether it was gold or silver or brass or whatever it may have been, depending on what it was, it may have been by itself enough for him to live the rest of his life on. Some of us, we've been given gifts that we use for ourselves. We've been given talents that we use to live our life however we want it. But we buried it in the earth. We've invested it in the world where there will never be a return. The gifts that God has given you is intended to be used for His glory or eternal things. Amen. There's nothing wrong with using them in the world if God's given you that. Hear me this. Let me meddle a minute. If you're a great salesman, God didn't intend for you just to make an almighty dollar with the gift that he's given you to communicate. Why don't you tell somebody about Jesus? If you're a great cook, when's the last time that you've cooked for somebody in need besides just your family? We pick up where we left off last week, Matthew chapter 25. The Lord had just reprimanded the lazy servant. God called him lazy. The reality was he was given a talent and he was given an opportunity to use it. I want to begin with verse 41 this morning. but He was given a talent and an opportunity to use it. Let me meddle a moment. I, I, I could deal heavily on excuses this morning but I assure you there will be no excuse that even comes from your mouth you won't even be able to so much as utter an excuse when you stand before God in judgment and he asked why didn't you use the talent what did you do with what I gave you 
Well, Lord, I was busy, and God, you know, I had the kids, and God, you know, I had this, and Lord, I had to work. None of those things will even roll off of your tongue. Those excuses are nothing more than that. You've been given 24 hours in every day. You've been given seven days in every week and 52 weeks in every year. On the heels of him dealing with that lazy servant, we'll pick up the same chapter. We kept reading it in context. I'm going to pick up with verse 41 just for the sake of time. It says Daniel, and this is where he's dealing with separating the sheep from the goats. The sheep from the goat. Let me let me stop for a moment. I got to do a little bit of bring you. The sheep and goats are both in the church. There's other passages where he warns the church to be weary of wolves in sheep's clothing. The wolves are the unchurched that may come in to to tear apart, but the goats exist. The goats follow the shepherd, but they're not sheep. Goats like to be near the shepherd. They like to be near Jesus, but they don't like to obey. Goats like to wander off and do their own thing. Sheep will stay close to the shepherd. Wherever he goes, they'll stay nearby. When we went to Israel, I had an opportunity to see this firsthand. It was amazing. I've, I've been around goats before and pastures and stuff. Never really had any, any close interactions with them, much to say. But I watched them there. And those little sheep, they would stay close to that shepherd. Wherever he went, they'd stay behind him. They'd graze a little bit, but they wouldn't wander away. The goats, on the other hand, it was like herding cats. After he'd get far enough away, they'd graze around here a little bit. They were tearing things up. I remember seeing one of them. He climbed up on this hedgerow, if you will, and he began to, to pick it apart. He'd climbed up on some rocks and was standing, just doing his own thing. And that's what goats do in the church. We hear the voice of the shepherd, but we go off and do our own thing. We like to follow him because we know that he'll lead us to, to a place of safety, that, that he'll look after us. We like the blessings of being close to the shepherd, but we don't want to actually listen to him. We don't want to have to submit to what he says. We like to do our own thing. What he's dealing with, on the heels of what we dealt with last week, as, as he's finishing that bolt, he says there's coming a day. After he deals with the one who is buried the talent, he said, You wicked and lazy servant, cast him into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he begins to say this. He said, There's coming a day where I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. In verse 41, he says, Then he'll say to them on the left hand, this is the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was not created for any man. I always stress that. I've heard it too many times. Pastor, how could a loving God send anybody to hell? God does not send anybody to hell. I like the way, I think it was Max Licato put it, that Jesus stretched his arms out, even allowing them to be nailed open for all eternity Literally declaring to the devil and to the world that over my dead body will any man or woman ever go to hell. You literally have to reject the body of Jesus Christ. God doesn't sin, we choose. He says, he'll say to them on the left hand, depart from me you cursed in the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you didn't even visit me. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and we didn't minister to you? And then he'll answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not, to one of the least of these you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If I had read for you verse 31, it would have just been dealing with the, the righteous. It would have been dealing with the sheep. And basically it said the same thing. Enter into the kingdom of heaven. Enter into the glory of God. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick, you visited me. Then he'll say to those on the left, but you... Even the ones on the right said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or naked? He said, I'm telling you the truth. Whenever you did it to the least of these, you did that to me. To the ones on the left. When he confronted them, they said, Lord, 
When did I see you hungry or thirsty? If I would have noticed, God, I would have done something. The Bible says we entertain angels unaware sometimes. You have opportunities every day of your life to minister to Jesus. Someone rewrote this. and It's not heretical. It's not false teaching. I want to read it for you. He said, I was hungry. And you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. I was imprisoned. And you crept off quietly to your chapel and prayed for me. I was naked. And in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. This one got me. All of these got me, but this one jumped out in my mind because I thought how many times I can't count on both hands and feet. And if I used all of yours this morning, still probably wouldn't be able to count how many times that I've had to have this debate in church because sometimes people come in and they, they don't look like they belong. They don't have the right clothes on. They don't, they don't dress like church people dress. Sometimes they don't smell like somebody you want to sit beside. I've seen it so many times in the church where somebody comes in and they don't, they don't have the right outfit. And we judge, how dare she wear that? I can't believe she wore that to church. Have you ever thought that may be all that they've got? The reality is, I, I, I told him in the first service, you know God cares about the prostitute even? My prayer is that this church would forever be a place that that, that prostitute could walk in off the street Amen. and somebody would open the door for her yes. and somebody would sit beside her and that the altar would be open for even such as that. In many churches, it's not the case. Now, I believe in modesty. The Bible teaches modesty. And if you know better and you have better, you ought to come to honor God with such as you have. The reality is one of Jesus' great-grandmothers was a prostitute. Rahab the harlot, look it up. This thing jumped off the page at me this morning because I guess it's fresh in my mind. We just did the baptismal service and every year I look at these pictures and I look at them all throughout the year. If you come in my office, you'll see I've got, and I thank Mrs. Diane Craig for, for doing this. Every year, I've got one of those pictures. We take the group pictures. And I'll look at that thing through the year, at the lives that have been touched. And I'll pray for those faces. And I draw strength, and I'm encouraged by that. But there's a man whose face jumped out at me this year as I began to look. In 2012, I believe it was. His name is Dennis. Dennis was baptized in 2012, but he started coming to the church earlier that year. And Dennis was homeless. Because he was homeless, Dennis didn't smell pleasant. He didn't look kemp. He'd come to church and he'd be disheveled. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you. There were people that complained to me. And there were people that wouldn't sit beside Dennis. And I understand. Dennis kept coming. Dennis was an alcoholic, and God touched his life, and Dennis gave his life to the Lord, and Dennis ended up getting baptized, and, and Dennis began to clean himself up. I don't know where he was getting a bath. He was still homeless, but Dennis started coming to church. He was, he was cleaner than he was normally. God began to clean him up. But what got my heart this morning is I, I, I looked at that picture, and I thought, you know, Dennis isn't with us anymore. A few months go by after he's baptized and we miss Dennis on a few services and then we hear that Dennis had stepped out into the road and gotten hit by a car. And 
And I wonder, Dennis had actually told me there were other churches in our neighborhood that he'd been in and he was not welcome. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And I wonder, and I know that people mean well. You know, I wonder when some of those people stand before God one day and he looks at them and he says, you remember when I came and I sat beside you and, and you quickly got up and you moved away? Do you remember how you went and complained to the preacher because I didn't smell good? He said, no, Lord, I don't, I don't remember you doing that. He said, oh, sure you do. Let me, let me show you my face. This is what the Word says. He said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. He said, I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick in prison. You didn't minister. You didn't come visit. This one that we wrote, I was naked. And in your mind, you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick. And you knelt down and you thanked God for your health. I was homeless and you preached to me about what a spiritual shelter the love of God was. I was lonely. You comforted me and left me alone so that you could go and pray for me. You seem so close to God, but I'm still so very hungry and lonely and cold. I heard of this deacon during a prayer service at their church. He was so fervently praying. The whole church was in prayer, but his prayers were fervent and passionate. And he was praying, God, take your mighty hand, Lord, and, and touch those who are in need. All of a sudden, the fervency of his prayers went deftly silent. The silence of his prayers deafened the whole room to the point that others who were praying stopped and they began to look. Is Bill okay? The pastor finally went over to him, knelt down beside him and whispered in his, bill, in his ear, Bill, are you okay? He said, yes. But I just heard the voice of God say, you are my hand. You've been praying that I would touch them by my mighty hand and I'm telling you, you are the hand. There's a song that says something like this. Look out and say, well, God, why don't you do something? He said, I did, I created you. You look around you and you see the, 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 the troubles in the world. You see the problems next to you. And oftentimes we're guilty. We're saying, God, why didn't you do something? He said, I did. I showed you the need. You are the hand. To think one day we're going to stand before God. And that's what he's going to say. Whatever you did to the least of these, you did it unto me. I shared last week some of the testimony of that young man in our youth group. But there's so many others that go through my mind. There's men like Dennis and there's so many others that I've seen come to the church. And I thought even last week and I said again this week. You have gifts. You can be an encourager. A friend. The truth is, I, I think there are countless numbers of people probably within our own little circle who would be alive today if somebody would have just so much as picked the phone up and said, I love you and I care about you and I'm praying for you. Or somebody in the church that wasn't one of their family members had bothered to sit beside them long enough to find out their phone number so that they could call and say, I've missed you. It's been a couple weeks. I haven't seen you in church. People come into God's house broken and empty, desperate. And we're like a flashlight. We're comfortable in our seat. Let me encourage you. I'm putting a plug in here. This isn't part of my notes. But when we do our fellowship time, even if you don't put anything in the basket, get up out of your seat. Greet somebody. Shake somebody's hand. Hug somebody's neck. 
What, what, if, what if that were somebody that you had prayed for and you had, you had longed for them to finally come to church in their first visit and you got a room full of people and everybody's going around but nobody greets them? That happens. It's out of your comfort zone. I don't know them. Well, shake their hand and introduce yourself. You, you have this gift. In the first service, it hit me. Guys, we need encouragers. And some of you, you God has blessed you. You're a positive person. You always have a positive outlook. You, you see the glass half full. Do you know how rare that is? Or at least in the church. We've never had to recruit negative nillies. There's a lot of those. There's plenty of them. That's a gift we don't need any more of. But encouragers. When's the last time you just come by the Sunday school teacher? I appreciate what you do. I don't, I don't have children in there, but I appreciate what you do. Or maybe you do have children in there. And I, because I have children and I appreciate what you invest That encouragement goes a long ways. I can tell you there's more volunteers than I could count through the years that the only reason they stopped is because nobody cared anyway. All of a sudden, when they weren't volunteering, people cared. Pastor, we need somebody to do this. Pastor, we need somebody to do that. Yep. The reality, I, I, I shared this in the first service, I can count on one hand, and I want to commend those that are in this church that do that, I can count on one hand how many folks that I have that regularly encourage the pastor. I'd love to tell you that we had a whole church full. We have church fulls of people that are people and they have needs and they come, Pastor, I need this and Pastor, I'm hurting and I'm going through this and listen, that's my job and I, I, that's my calling. That's what I give. And I don't expect everybody to be an encourager. But I can tell you that God has used the gift of that handful of people. I'm convinced today that I wouldn't be where I'm at if it weren't for some of them. Their timely prayers, their timely texts, the timely cards you get in the mail. Listen, if God's blessed you with a cell phone, you can call somebody and encourage them. If you can afford a stamp, you've got a gift that some people don't. You can write them a letter and tell them, I love you, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you. Some of you, you've been the beneficiary of some of those text messages or phone calls or letters that showed up at just the right time. Let God use the gift that he's given you, but that seems so small. You, you underestimate what God can do with you if you just let God have the gift that he's already put in your hands. So I, I can't offer God anything. I, I realized this morning, you know what? A little tiny pump, a small pump buried hundreds of feet below the surface of the earth can bring water to an entire village. Maybe you're that little pump if you let God hide you in a place where it's not about you, but God gets the glory. God can bring that living water to the surface and change an entire nation. But the pump without the pipe will produce nothing. Some of you, you may say, Pastor, I'm not even the pump. I, maybe you're just the pipe, a conduit. Then say, here I am, God. However you can use me, I am yours. I'll tell you, I pray until the day that I die and never forget this. I don't know how to preach. I don't know what I'm doing. How can I? I've never done it before. I am but a conduit in the master's hands. I present myself to God, Lord. I don't know anything, Lord. But if you can use me, God, here I am. I let God use me. I let the Holy Spirit speak through me. You underestimate what God can do. Maybe it's just a song. Maybe it's just a testimony. Maybe it's holding a child in a nursery, smiling at somebody. I love people just that smile all the time. They bless me. Because in my world, I don't see people smiling all the time. I see a lot of broken and hurting people. 
So I cherish the ones that smile. I cherish even those that smile in brokenness. I visited sickly old women and old men in the hospital before that I have showed up and and my goal, my objective was to be an encouragement to them that day. But I showed up and they blessed me in return because they talked about how good God was in the midst of their sickness, in the midst even of dying sometimes. Because sometimes I walk in the room and I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders and I've come to encourage them and do my best. But I'm concerned about things that probably don't matter. And then when I hear them testify how good God is, it puts life in perspective. And I think, what am I worried about this stuff for? You know, I could be in that bed today. And I'm grumbling and I'm complaining. I'm feeling down and I could thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for those that you have gifted to be an encourager to me. How many lives would be saved? I was thinking this morning, this young girl that I knew of, 13 years old, that overdosed so she'd never wake up again. And she succeeded in that. She didn't want to go home anymore. The amount of abuse in her home was overwhelming, and she didn't think anybody in this world cared about her. I want to tell you, church, the reality is those kids don't always live on the wrong side of the tracks. Sometimes they live in your neighborhood. Sometimes they're in your family. It's not always a poverty issue. So again, I share with you my heart from last week. If I can tell somebody I love them, I'm going to tell them I love them. They may look at me cross, they may look at me funny, but I refuse to let someone like that, whether they're young or older, I, I refuse to let them leave my presence if I can help it. And think nobody cares, somebody cares. I may not know you, but I do care. I heard this story years ago, and I don't know if it's true or not. But a young man in ninth grade who was bullied and ridiculed and picked on all of his life, and he finally got to the point he couldn't take it anymore, and he went to his locker, and he took everything out of his locker, was toting the whole stack out of the school with him because he was going to take his life when he got home, and he didn't want his parents to have to come to school and dig through his stuff. On his way down the hallway... One of those bullies knocked him and knocked all his books on the ground. And that was just one more nail in the coffin. As he bent down to pick him up, reassured in his decision to end his life, there came another student by that day and helped him pick his books up and befriended the outcast. Never said a word to anybody. That one friend gave him enough encouragement. That young man as the story goes on, was the valedictorian of his school at graduation day. And for the first time ever, he shared his story. And he thanked his friend. He said, you didn't know that day, but I was going to end my life. But when you knelt down to help me pick those books up, I realized that somebody does care. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Lord, if I knew... Lord, if I knew that was you, I would have never, I would have never missed an opportunity. My heart goes out here. I, for me, I thank Miss Barbara Rowe. She was one of my Sunday school teachers. I thank her for being where she was. For investing in my life. There was a teacher, I give God all the glory, but a teacher, and I've, I've called her name before, but I'll give her a great deal of the credit. Miss Costner in 10th grade. I had made up my mind that my life was not worth a whole lot. 
This mindset came, I, I came from a loving home. Parents that I could not have handpicked better parents that loved me, loved me, absolutely loved me. No abuse. Never did I question their love. But Satan had gripped my mind. Your pastor was adopted and Satan had gripped my mind and made me feel like I was just somebody's trash throwaway. That, that I was worth nothing. And I had bought it hook, line, and sinker. So around the age of 15, I made up my mind that if nobody else cared about me, then why did I care about me? And I had set my eyes on a destructive path, and I didn't care what the outcome was, quite frankly. And I met this teacher, and I would do anything that I could to get in trouble. When this teacher handled me differently, I didn't understand what was going on. Not then. I'm not a real tall guy, but she was shorter than me, and I can still picture Miss Costner putting her arm around me. At the end of class, she would call me out, and, and she would begin to talk to me, to build me up, tell me what potential I had. I could see that she cared for me. I, I would love to tell you that I changed overnight. That didn't happen, but I'm telling you the truth. There were nights that I couldn't sleep because I believed what she said. I believed that she cared about me. There were nights that I couldn't sleep thinking, maybe she's right, I am wasting my life. It would be after that I was saved that I realized what she was doing was she was modeling the love of Jesus Christ. I identified her because she never preached a sermon to me. She didn't tell me about Jesus. She loved me like Jesus. The pastor, I, I can't make it. You might make a difference for one. This little illustration years ago of this man walking down the coast. Starfish had washed up all over the coast. And he's picking them up and throwing them in. There are thousands upon thousands. And one of the locals walks by him and says, you're wasting your time. You'll never make any difference. Without missing a beat, he bends over, he picks up another starfish, and he throws it in the ocean. He said, for this one, I made a difference. Amen. She never made a difference in anybody else. She made a difference in my life. If God had never, never called me to preach a sermon, if I had never taught a Sunday school class, the gift that he had given me to share the gospel message with my dad. Less than a year before he would end up passing away. See, that one I made a difference in. If I never preached a sermon to a crowd of people, I made a difference in that one. And see, that difference you make, it may matter more than you realize. The magnitude of the gift that God has given you is far greater than your comprehension. It may be as simple as a smile. It may be as simple a gesture as a hug. It may be as simple as just telling the neighborhood kids, you know, I care about you. It may be as simple as you inviting them to church, giving them a ride. Our last church and youth ministry, we had... A lady in our church, she lived out in Gaston. And there's so many kids there from broken situations, just terrible, some of them really terrible. God got a hold of her and she started bringing kids to church. She'd pack them in like sardines. They wouldn't fit in her car anymore. So she asked the church, can I, can I take the church van home? I need more room. I got more kids. I can't bring. They, they won't fit in the car. Somebody ended up giving that lady a van. She started bringing more kids to church. We started feeding some of those kids breakfast because they wasn't eating at home. She'd bring them early enough. She Listen, it cost her something to do what God had laid on her heart. She had to get up earlier. Sacrifice her gas. Bring kids that she really didn't know. Who a lot of times created drama and problems that she had to deal with and clean up. People started complaining. Broke my heart. Because I was in youth ministry and I thought the audacity of some of these people they don't even know. Now, these were kids. Most of them weren't old enough to be 
There's some, I guess, that were in my youth group. but Because they would come in the kitchen to get their coffee, and here's a whole kitchen full of kids. A dozen or more of them. And they're doing what kids are doing, being silly and loud. And I heard comments like, you know, they don't need to be coming to church this early. That's all they're going to do. And I thought, you, don't have, you have no idea, no idea. Because you're going to go home today and you're going to eat lunch. And if you wanted breakfast this morning, you'd have cooked it or you just went and bought yourself something. But you have no idea. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. I praise God those kids didn't hear, but it broke my heart to see. That's the reality inside the walls of the church sometimes. We're so busy, so distracted about our own business. We started feeding them. It required more people. Other people started getting up early so they could come and cook for these kids. What's God put in your hands? That's right, I can cook, I can do something. You have no idea what it may mean. Just take up your cross and follow me. The truth is we all have a lot of things to do. We have such busy schedules. We have obligations and priorities. But let me just be real. God's given you 24 hours in every day. For some today, even if you say, I don't know what my gift is, you have the gift of life if you can't think of any others. Some of you shouldn't even be alive this morning. Others, you may not have such a drastic situation, but the truth is the obituary tells that you're fortunate, you're gifted today with breath. You have an opportunity. In line at the grocery store, to show the love of Jesus Christ, to tell others of the hope that you have, to be an encourager. Listen. We stand before Him. We may be like this rich young ruler. Some say, well, I'm, I'm glad you're not preaching to me because I'm not rich, but you are. That talent that God's given you is so priceless. I don't know what that talent is, but here's what I know. If you're not using what God's put in your hands, you're going to stand before the Lord one day and give an account, and you will have no excuse. If you can drive a nail, I'm sure there's something you can do for God. There was a little widow woman. She went on to be with the Lord now, and some of you in here know her. She came to our church. You want to know how she came? Because she had a carport in her backyard that needed to be moved. And we had men who God had given strength that could go move a carport for a lady. One of these little ones that's just, just a little covering, if you will. Didn't seem like much. So we move a carport for this little lady. And she started coming to church, and we fell in love with her, and she fell in love with us. And when she passed, we had an opportunity to witness to much of her family. God's given you the abilities. and I wonder how many of us are like the rich young ruler. This treasure, this treasure that God's given us, in the parable of the talents, they went and traded and that word traded, literally, it just means you take something of value and you exchange it for something you believe has more value. We do that with our hard-earned money. We go to a restaurant and we exchange it for a meal because we believe it's worth more than our hard-earned money. I've been to some restaurants that I won't go back because I don't think it was a good trade. I didn't get my money's worth. What a shame. When he was given an invitation to follow Jesus Christ, there was something that he held on to and he didn't think that was an equitable trade. If I give this to you, I'm getting the short end of the stick. 
Hear me this morning. Some of you have been just like this rich young ruler. You're rich in spiritual things and you don't even know it. And you walk out of here still holding on to those things as though they belong to you. You've walked away from an opportunity to serve Christ. Every day you have an opportunity to minister to Jesus, not just for him. Whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And sometimes those excuses are simply, Lord, I've got kids, and so I've got a spouse, and Lord, I've got all these other things, and we've got ball games, and we've got travel this, and we've got travel that, and Lord, you know, I've got to work late, and, and God, you know, I can't do that. You, you're riddled with excuses, but basically what you're saying is, Lord, that's not a fair trade. Right now, I need to invest that time that I have here. You're making a calculated decision every day you're investing. Now, if we're talking about dollars, I'm not a real smart guy, but if you told me there's a place that I can invest my money for a 1% return, and then there's a place that I can invest it, and I'm going to get 100% return every time, I'm going to take everything I got and dump it into that. <laughs> Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasure. That's what he told the rich young ruler. Trade what you have. Exchange it for something of greater value. Stand with me all over the house. Every head bowed. A.W. Tozer said, Before the judgment seat of Christ, my service will be judged not by how much I have done, but by how much I could have done. In God's sight, my giving is measured not by how much I've given, but by how much I have left after I made my gift. Not by its size is my gift judged, but by how much of me there was in it. No man gives at all until he has given all. No man gives anything acceptable to God until he has first given himself in love and sacrifice. Nobody's looking around. He said, what I've given is not going to be measured by how much I've given, but how much I could have given. I'm not going to stand before God one day and be judged on how much I did, but how much I could have done. And that may not sound reasonable to you, but let me give you a visual that will make it make sense. Let's suppose I'm in a boat in the lake. And there's six people drowning in the water. No life jackets and they're going under. Five of them are a little ways off, but one's real close to the boat. And I reach over and I pull him in. I've saved his life. I look down at my watch and I realize I've got lunch plans. So I have to hurry. So I quickly jet off to the dock. And I let him out. I'm a hero. I've saved a life. Truly, you say to life, what a heroic thing to do. But none would judge me as a hero because it's not about how much I did, but what I could have done. You, you excused yourself when the reality is there are people that are dying. The reality this morning is there are people that are dying and going to hell, and you and I know Jesus Christ. And it may be as simple as picking up a kid in the neighborhood. It may be as simple as telling somebody you work with what God's doing in your life. It may be a little thing like hugging somebody's neck or telling them, you know, I care about you. And you've allowed so many things to stand in your way to keep you from that. Every head bowed, every eye closed. These altars are open this morning. Some, I know some today, you're not physically able to do what you used to be able to do. And God understands that. What you need to say is, Lord, what can I do with what's in my hand today? Some, you may not be as young as you used to be. And I understand that. But God, you know, I can pray. Lord, because I understand today, Lord, the seriousness of this, God. I'll pray with fervency that I never did when I was a young man. These altars are open this morning. I want to invite you to come. Maybe you can be an encourager. Maybe you can just be a friend. Lord, show me what you would have for me to do. 
remember this story of a young man who grew up in the ghetto. He was hungry. His clothes were tattered and children would bully him and pick on him. One young man looked at him one day and said, if God is so good, then why doesn't he take care of you? Why doesn't he give you a coat to wear and food to eat and shoes? The little boy began to cry and he looked up at him and said, maybe he does. Maybe he tells somebody and somebody forgets. There's a mission field in our backyard. I believe that God has given every one of us priceless eternal treasures. Would you come this morning and say, God, help me change a life. All over this house, I want you to come. Find you a spot and pray. Open our eyes to see the souls of men and women around us, God. Maybe you can cook a meal for somebody that's sick. Extend a hand of friendship to somebody who has no friends. Maybe be an encourager to somebody that's so discouraged and broken and empty. I feel the Holy Spirit tugging on my heart this morning. There's somebody in here today, you feel so empty that you don't have anything you can offer. See, God can use broken things, you know. Say, God, I feel so broken, so empty. I I don't have anything to offer anyone. But if you can use me, Lord, then here I am. See, God takes broken men and women and He uses them to be an encourager even to others. You need to link arms with somebody. All over the house, worship with us this morning. Holy Spirit, help us to see the faces of men and women that you've put around us, Lord, to touch, to impact their lives. Sell all. Oh Lord, we bless you. In and out of situations, the tug of war. All day long I struggle. For the answers that I need Then I come into His presence And all my questions become
to give up in despair. Oh, church, just slip away and breathe his name. He will surely meet you there. In the presence of Jehovah.
bless you and we praise your holy name again my prayer is your servant this morning is that you would open our eyes to see the needs all around us Lord open our hearts God that we might open our hands to release the gifts Lord that you've given us with a sense of urgency your word reminds us we must be busy about the Father's business while there's light, while there's time. For the hour comes when no man can work. Give us a sense of urgency, Lord, and awareness 
eyes to see the souls of men and women around us, God, that we would be passionate. Father, I pray today, oh Lord, a blessing over this congregation. Help us, oh Lord, to impact those around us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And you won't leave here like you came.